knows the current phase of the moon? Anybody willing to venture a guess? It's a waxing crescent. It was a new moon last night. Who here knows if they went to the North Carolina coast and waited 24 hours, how many high tides they would see? This is easy. Two. Who knows when you enter the Duke Chapel what direction you're facing? To the west, slightly to the north, but mostly to the west. Now, here comes the hardest question I'm going to ask you. What time did the sun rise this morning? You are all a little off. It's 528. That is early, especially for all of you New Yorkers. I'm asking you these questions because I've always been very interested in how the modern conveniences of our natural world, such as artificial lighting and indoor heating and cooling, have impacted our perceptions of our natural world. Several years ago, I offered an undergraduate course entitled Ancient and Modern Perceptions of Our Natural World, and I asked all the students assembled these same questions on that very first day of class, and they fared pretty much like you did. There was one student, though, who had the best answer ever to the question about when the sun rose that morning, and her answer was, way before I did. <laughs> Perfect. How can you get more accurate than that? But not everyone sleeps past the sunrise. Through the millennia, we've had very keen observationalists who've made sharp observations about the natural world that have overturned our assumptions. We all know about Galileo, whose observations through his own telescope of the four moons orbiting around Jupiter totally shattered the current view then that all heavenly bodies rotated around Earth. But you may not know about Nicola Steno, who's a Danish anatomist who worked in the Medici court in Florence. Steno was very interested, as a naturalist as well, in the small stones embedded in the granite in the hills around Tuscany. The locals called those small stones tongue stones. Now, one day, Nicholas Steno was invited to do a public dissection in the square there in Florence of a great white shark that had been brought in by local fishermen. And when Steno looked into the gaping mouth of that great white shark, he realized that those tongue stones embedded in that granite were actually shark teeth. And from that one observation, Steno understood that that granite was once the sediment of the ocean floor that collected the shark teeth. And from that observation, it totally overturned the understanding at the time that the Earth was just simply a few thousand years old. And then you may not know about Count Rumford. And Count Rumford is actually one of my favorites. And his story begins in 1751, when a British sea captain was making a transit across the tropical Atlantic. And on that transit, he was asked to make measurements of the ocean temperature at depth. And so with a wooden bucket, which had a small thermometer of Mr. Fahrenheit's in it, the sea captain and the crew measured the ocean temperatures from the surface to more than 1,000 meters in depth. And what they found, not surprisingly, was that the surface waters were very, very warm, but the waters at depth were very, very cold. Now, to the sea captain and the crew, this didn't mean that much. In fact, they really only uh, it mattered to them because they said that they found a means to cool their baths and cool their wines with that source of cold water. But it was really interesting to Count Rumford, who came upon this letter with this information transmitted 49 years later in 1800. And Count Rumford was very puzzled because he couldn't understand how those deep waters could be so cold because the air temperatures were never that cold, not at night, not in the winter. So from that single observation, Count Rumford deduced that those deep waters in the tropics had to have their origin of the surface waters up in the Arctic or in the Antarctic. And so in 1800, he described what today we know as the ocean's overturning circulation and what's properly called the conveyor belt. Waters up in the Arctic seas, Greenland, Norwegian seas become cool. Those surface waters become cool in the winter. They sink. They flow to distant parts of the globe where they warm and upwell and then eventually return to their formation site. We're interested in this overturning circulation not just because it moves water, but because it also moves heat. And the heat that's moved along that conveyor belt has strong impacts for regional and also global climate. 
But today we're also interested in that overturning circulation for another reason, and a reason that would be unimaginable to Count Rumford. We're interested in that overturning circulation today because we understand now that the ocean is a reservoir for the carbon dioxide that we've put into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution because of fossil fuel burning. So I'm going to walk you through what I'm showing here behind me. Imagine you were on a research vessel and you were filing along this red line in this inset. And you're moving southward through the Atlantic from Iceland, then you move across the Southern Ocean, and then you move northward up into the Pacific Ocean. Then we're going to take the distance along that track, and so zero represents where we are in Iceland, and then 30,000 kilometers later, we'd end up off the Alaskan waters. On that ship, we're going to be taking measures of the carbon dioxide in the ocean water, and so we're going to measure at the surface and also at depth. Everywhere where you see color is where that carbon dioxide, that man-made carbon dioxide, is now in the ocean. The red colors mean high concentrations, and the blue mean relatively low concentrations. We expected to see the carbon dioxide in the surface waters because the ocean is exposed to the atmosphere. But when we see and look at those carbon dioxide in the water at depth, we see the conveyor belt, the ocean overturning in action. Those surface waters took that man-made carbon dioxide, and now they're storing it at depth. So will the ocean circulation, will that deep ocean continue to be a carbon dioxide reservoir? And is this a good news or bad news that the ocean is a carbon dioxide reservoir? It's good news if we think that that carbon dioxide is now stored in the deep ocean and not in the atmosphere, where it could, as a greenhouse gas, cause more warming. But it's bad news because we understand that the increase of carbon dioxide in the ocean creates ocean acidification, which is an unhappy prospect for marine ecosystems. So what's going to happen? This is where my work comes in, because the extent to which the ocean continues to be a carbon reservoir depends on the ocean overturning, and that's exactly what I study. Why would the overturning change? As we continue to warm the ocean. Warmer waters are less dense, less prone to sinking. As glaciers and sea ice melt, fresher waters are less dense, less prone to sinking. Our expectation is that as the waters, if they're less prone to sinking, then the overturning will slow. But we don't know how much, and we don't know that for certain. So my idea was that we go to the、um, high latitudes. Of the、uh, North Atlantic, where these deep waters are formed, and we measure in the Labrador Sea and the Norwegian Greenland Sea the temperature salinity, and we measure the overturning itself. From a workshop four years ago on the Duke campus, I've been leading an international team of oceanographers that will be set to deploy this obser observational array that's now funded by the National Science Foundation this summer. So we plan to measure from the Labrador coast to Greenland, and then from Greenland. To Scotland, and how are we going to measure? Well, years ago, decades ago, we only had one choice in terms of how we were measuring the ocean, and that was to be aboard a research vessel that slowly made its way across the ocean, collected water samples, and recorded those measurements while on board. Now, a little bit earlier, I told you that I, that technology in many ways insulates us from the natural world, but the technology also really allows us today to measure the natural world in unprecedented ways. And so, for example, how we measure the ocean today, instead of always being on a ship, we have the opportunity to deploy gliders and floats from small watercraft. Once deployed, these gliders go on their merry way. Taking measurements as they go from the surface to depth of the temperature, salinity, and other properties, they're guided by an oceanographer sitting at a workstation in her office. And then, when those gliders are finished, they pop to the surface, relay their information to a satellite, and that satellite then relays the information to that same workstation. For those oceanographers like me that are prone to seasickness, these are a godsend. <laughs> Fabulous. And so, when we go out there this summer, we'll be using a combination of the then and now. What you're looking at here is where our observational ray is going to go in from Labrador to Greenland to Scotland. The black is the underwater topography. The colors there show the salinity of these waters we're going to be studying. 
We're looking at from depth to 4,000 meters. Wherever you see a line there, that is where a ship is going to go, drop a cable with a line of instruments, and where you see the shaded regions are where we're going to have gliders and floats patrolling the waters. What do we hope to find with this? We hope to understand the overturning here where these deep waters are formed and how vulnerable the overturning is to the changing temperatures and salinity of the waters. So what does this have to do with Duke? This has to do with Duke because I am Duke. Whether I'm in the classroom at sea or standing here in front of you, Duke's afforded me fantastic opportunities. The university has fostered my intellectual and professional development and given me fantastic students to work with and colleagues to work with as well through the years. The ocean also has something to do here with the campaign, and this is the connection I want to make here for you. The um, ocean is primarily driven by energy, a source of which is the wind. Now, when we have sustained periods of weak winds, the surface waters are depleted of nutrients, there's low wave energy, and there's slack currents. But when strong winds arrive, nutrients are brought to the surface, blooms occur, there's strong currents that carry heat and carbon across the globe, and waves propagate across great distances. A campaign to the university is as wind to the ocean. A university campaign, a capital can campaign, can create strong currents that can move the ideas and visions of the university forward. It can create blooms locally, all the while moving students and programs and faculty to places around the globe. And it can extend a faculty member's reach by aiding the propagation of an idea, a lecture, or an innovation. Essentially, a capital campaign adds fluidity to a university because it can go places it couldn't go before. So with the commitment of all of you here, and the commitment of everyone else in the Duke community scattered around this globe, I have every confidence that this capital campaign will create for Duke a whole ocean of progress. Thank you.